the, the next panel is uh, still in the metaverse field, and we're talking about a, a more uh, uh, a more serious discussion about uh, ownership in the metaverse, uh, legal tech talk. Uh, we have with us uh, Conrad Gill from VRCIS, uh, Dr. Simon Planzer from Planzer Law, and I think there was supposed to be uh, Arthur Stadler. I'm not sure if he, he joined in, but uh, anyway, I'm going to leave you guys the leave you guys the stage. Uh, welcome and uh, have at it. Hello, am I here already, Alex? Hello from the metaverse. <laughs> hi, hi. Simon is here. I see him. Hello from the metaverse to Switzerland. And mm -hmm. Arthur is here too. I'm not seeing Arthur, but uh, maybe he'll join in. I'm going to pop him a quick email right now. Yes, yeah, so basically, um, honestly, I wouldn't have thought like a year ago or half a year ago when we had um, the last uh, tech conference that um, legal practices will come so fast into the metaverse. So we regarded it as a, like a, a free space, uh, like the early uh, internet uh, in the 90s. Um, but now with the recent boom and uh, big corporations like Facebook uh, explaining to go into the metaverse uh, and build the metaverse and uh, uh, the NFT boom um, and things like digital land ownership and um, all these beauties of um, the uh, of a legal of, of legal state and economy coming also now to the metaverse. Um, I'm very happy to have like probably the two most uh, modern lawyers in Europe here on the panel. Um, Simon Planzer from uh, Switzerland and maybe later Arthur Stadler from Vienna. But until um, Arthur is here, I know Simon, you prepared some thoughts about uh, what you think from legal perspective about the. Uh, legal frame of the metaverse. Um, yeah, Simon, the stage is yours. Sure, very glad uh, to take it from here. It's great to see you in Meta Vienna, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it does actually really look great, the view you have over Meta Vienna indeed. Um, um, so yeah, if this is fine by you, Conrad, while we are waiting for uh, Arthur, I can maybe start with a few thoughts and and then uh, we take it from there. Wonderful. So if I'm permitted to uh, share my screen, I can briefly uh, pull up the presentation that we have here. Let me just see. Share. There we should be. Your presentation is already in the metaverse, so I could do the filming for you from here, but... <laughs> Oh, that's pretty, pretty cool this. as well, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the thought. <laughs> really great. Um, I'm here on several screens. I'm just moving uh, things around here. Um, so welcome, everybody. Again, uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, we are giving you some thoughts from, from a legal regulatory perspective. Uh, myself, Arthur, and uh, Conrad. So... Let me just uh, start from the outset. What I had in mind uh, to share with you today, um, we're just going to put this on full screen. Uh, what I had in mind to briefly touch upon today were the following three topics, NFTs, a boundless marketplace. And then I find very, very hot and topical crime in the metaverse, question mark, is this is this possible and, uh, and how would constellations look like where we could have crime involved and is the metaverse the new black market essentially so these are the three themes i will briefly touch upon and i think it will mostly be about raising some interesting questions and then i'm, I'm looking forward to further elaborating together with with all of you and uh, my colleague uh, arthur but just before I touch on the first point, I'm just going to say a few words uh, on myself. I've essentially uh, two hats on, or at least at least two hats on. Uh, one is in practice, 
uh, at my own uh, law firm where I'm the founding partner. And we have a strong focus on technology matters, entertainment, and also we practice uh, criminal law as well. Um, and we have a very diverse set of, of clients. They reach from global market leaders to small innovative uh, startups that we help with. And my second head would be in academia uh, teaching. I work at the University of St. Gallen as well, where I'm also leading a competence center on gaming and various forms of entertainment. Uh, and finally, I also wrote my, my PhD in a kind of related field on gaming regulation uh, with stops at various universities there. But coming back to uh, the first topic, NFTs, the boundless marketplace, you, you see a few um, quotes here covered uh, in the media. And I'll just like to sink in a bit on you. I think uh, this gives a very good brief taste of uh, what this is about. I'll just give you a few seconds to, to read a bit for yourself. So when you see these, uh, maybe in the right down corner, you have the so-called funky apes. And for, for those who are not familiar with them, they're actually selling at very, very high rates. So they have become a good that is actually, uh, that is actually ready to, to, be, to, be, uh, to be bought at, at very high prices. And uh, what you see involved there as a phenomenon is also that you have stars, celebrities uh, buying such funky apes. And of course, what happens then is that their supporters, their followers uh, will follow their, their example and would like to have funky apes as well. Another uh, thing you see represented here is virtual land, virtual land that is being sold. Um, there are no benefits of a virtual piece of land per se, and no immediate tangible uh, benefits. But again, these virtual lands may sell at very high prices. So of course, what cannot be excluded are scams with uh, prepayment and that people might not get uh, anything in the reward. Um, of course, these are typically anonymous uh, transactions uh, on the blockchain. So there is another exposure there involved. I then wanted also briefly to touch on the topic of crime in the metaverse. Oh, let me just change this to slideshow, of course, that's more appropriate. Much better view. Here we go. Crime in the metaverse. And uh, what, of course, you have here is the big question is the law as we are used to it uh, from the terrestrial field, is this actually applicable? to the metaverse as well. Can you commit crime in the metaverse ultimately? And if you can, what kind of, what kind of crimes, what kind of offenses would that be? Um, you, you see uh, phenomena such as the ones represented here in metaverse app allows kids into virtual strip clubs. So by age requirements, that would typically not be something happening in the terrestrial world, but in the metaverse, it is or may be possible. And uh, of course, there's a big, uh, a big uh, betting, if you want so, on an immersive digital world and uh, important questions about the harms are indeed arising. So what kind of crime, you know, can we look at? Uh, I think we will be able to touch upon this afterwards as well. We have violence involved. We may have uh, fraud uh, involved. 
And I think an additional question that pops up here is also how to prevent these crimes. And again, of course, the setting in the metaverse is very different uh, to the terrestrial experience. So I think this is a topic I would, I would love to maybe uh, further elaborate also with my colleagues afterwards and with everybody in the audience. I'm moving forward uh, to this one and I have a short video that uh, I've prepared for you to briefly listen in. It's just uh, one to two minutes. And I think that can give you a little taste of one kind of offenses that may be involved uh, in the metaverse. I'm just checking with Sultan and Alex. Is it better if you play the video in terms of sound quality? Yeah, we can play it. Just... OK, then please go ahead. It's full of surprises and opportunities. But here's something we rarely say about the future. It's volatile and dangerous. I'm talking about the metaverse. If you ask Mark Zuckerberg, it's the best thing on earth. You can meet new people, you can have new experiences, you can build new businesses. It's a win-win for all. But let me share the story of 43-year-old Nina Jane Patel from London. And then you can decide. Patel works at a technology firm in Britain. She was testing out Facebook's metaverse technology. She logged in, she created an avatar, and she went exploring. Do you know what happened next? Her avatar was raped by other users. Let me repeat. Her virtual avatar was gang raped by other metaverse users. Here's what Nina Patel wrote on her blog. Within 60 seconds of joining, I was verbally and sexually harassed, three to four male avatars with male voices essentially, but virtually gang raped my avatar and took photos. Nina Patel was traumatized. She threw out her headphones and logged out. And since then, she's suffering from anxiety. Does this news surprise you? I'm asking because it does not surprise me. When women are not safe in the real world, how can we be safe or we be expected to be safe in the virtual world. You fa your face is different, your name is different, so metaverse users are free to do whatever they want. And I know what some people are thinking. Nothing actually happened. Nobody was physically hurt. Well, I have two things to say to that. One, it reveals the users' disgusting impulses. Thinking about raping someone is also wrong, by the way. Using your virtual avatar to rape someone is also wrong. And two, such crimes are not just about the physical hurt, it's also about the mental trauma. I'll go back to what Nina Patel wrote. A horrible experience that happened so fast and before I could even think about putting the safety barrier in place, I froze. It was surreal. It was a nightmare. What is Meta slash Facebook doing about this? Well, they have released a statement. This is what it says. Horizon venue should be safe, and we are committed to building it that way. We will continue to make improvements as we learn more about how people interact in these spaces, especially when it comes to helping people report things easily and reliably. FYI, Horizon is a metaverse platform run by Facebook. This statement is along expected lines, safe and diplomatic. But try reading between the lines. Facebook is essentially saying, this is trial and error. We will continue to make improvements as we learn more about how people interact. I hate to break it to Mark Zuckerberg, but human beings are not his guinea pigs. You cannot sacrifice the mental health of users to perfect your platform. And this is not happening for the first time. Think back to the internet and social media. The same thing happened. The applications came first. The rules came later. The result was this. Fake news, hate speech, identity thefts. We should not repeat the same mistake with the metaverse. There must be rules and regulations, how to interact with other avatars, how to, change, how to exchange money, what is permitted and what is not. These guidelines must be established first. Unfortunately, we are going in the opposite direction. Launch the platform, get billions of users, then wait for each user to complain. 
trust me, this is going to be a massive legal complication. For instance, your assets in the metaverse, how will they be taxed? Your crimes in the metaverse, how will they be proved? I'm not saying the metaverse is a bad idea. It offers endless opportunities to people. But it's an unfinished product. And big tech alone cannot be trusted to finish it. The laws, the taxes, the crimes, all of it must be regulated by the state as well. If not, such crimes will keep happening. In December last year, another metaverse tester reported being groped. And this happened on the same platform, Horizon. Two months later, it's happened again. What is the point of beta testing if the problems are never rectified? Having said that, it's not too late. Governments and courts can still intervene to set things right. They have the laws. What they need is new procedures. For example, in many countries, sexual harassment does not require bodily contact. Those same laws can apply here. But the question is, how do you prove it? How do you find the person behind the avatar? If such groundwork is not done, the metaverse could become a murky real world. Vion is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move. Okay, so that was different. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. That's Thank you for your, helping That's me. not your daily uh, news broadcast. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. So thank you very much, Alex, for uh, helping with this. Um, I will go back on sharing. That is fine with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, meanwhile, I saw Arthur joined. So mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, you have that in mind? Uh, I, I'm just uh, going through one or two more slides. And then I think uh, we can continue with, with our uh, colleagues. OK, perfect. And I'm just, uh, okay. Uh, I'm not yet sharing, am I? Uh, no, not yet. No, now it's uh, now no. yeah. Wonderful, thank you. So yes, as you could see from this short uh, clip, actually uh, reporting from an actual uh, lift through story by one of the users, uh, we have here a very serious crime uh, involved if you make the link to the terrestrial world, um, we have serious uh, consequences involved, mental health disorder, anxiety disorder. So this person is suffering from the consequences that she lived through. And of course we have big legal questions here involved uh, to which extent is classic criminal law applicable to such a situation, which offenses uh, would it reflect um, even further which prosecutors, which authorities would be competent um, to, to actually go after it? Is there a possibility of self-regulation? Is it possible that somebody like uh, Conrad, Conrad Gill, uh, is setting up some self-regulatory body uh, that would inquire it on their sphere of, of metaverse? Uh, I'm happy to have uh, Conrad comment, uh, commenting on it afterwards. You see, it involves many pretty heavy and serious uh, legal questions uh, fairly quickly. So that was my example, just to illustrate one possibility of uh, criminal offenses. And then finally, the last point I briefly wanted to touch upon was uh, Metaverse, the new black market uh, question mark. and. We have really uh, interesting, uh, sorry for that, interesting phenomena here, such as um, from the crypto island. You might have heard about that story when it broke that, in fact, in this business endeavor, you have people selling uh, parts of the island, uh, slots of the island for quite, um, for quite substantial amounts of money but actually there is no direct link to that physical island and these actual, uh, actual uh, real estate lots. But again, the, uh, the virtual lots, they would sell for big amounts of money. So again, the question here is, is this the new black market? Um, is anybody looking into this, into regulating this? because people do, for a fact, 
spend quite significant amounts of money on this. So um, thanks a lot. That was indeed just uh, the three kind of themes I wanted to uh, present to you and to, to invite everybody to participate lively in our uh, discussions. So also beyond Arthur and, and Conrad, very happy to have your comments on, on these. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, these are indeed uh, really big core questions <laughs> that come up. And um, I see that Arthur is here. And uh, what I know, Arthur also has some, uh, some uh, pre-thoughts before our discussion. So please, if you put Arthur on big. It seems Arthur has some uh, some issues with uh, the connection. Maybe we can uh, move on a little bit. And when he he gets a stable connection, he would pop in. I mean, sure. like <clears throat> okay, then like I <laughs> I start with a question that immediately like uh, uh, popped up to me when you uh, when you were talking about. Um, uh, the different fields. I mean, each of them, I guess, could be its own discussion. I mean, like a the NFT and like the real like the ownership, but also the crime question is very um, is very interesting. Um, like which body like goes after which crime? I personally think one of the big problems here is like the way how you think metaverse. Yeah, like when you think it like Mark Zuckerberg or like a big entity which is like centralized, and when there is like a centralized metaverse, then there has to be somehow like a centralized authority. If I'm thrown in in virtual worlds and I cannot like control who is with me in the world or or or, or are there trolls or are there, I mean like this gang rape thing, like it's as shocking as it can get, I think, uh, from, a, from a crime perspective in the metaverse. People feeling anonymous, people like feeling um, 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 empowered still like from the social media. But I actually, for this, I brought a meme here which came to uh, my attention when we were when 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 the whole like groping thing came up because like Facebook to the explanation Facebook um, um, faced this uh, issue already with like then introducing um, uh, space bubbles and so on and then basically coming more from the side like uh, where the metaverse is like owned by each and everyone so if like I make a server. And I'm responsible for the for the server. What happens on my server, and people can join or not, because I think it's very critical to judge um, what is okay for one person might not be okay for uh, for another. In some virtual worlds, it's absolutely okay to I don't know, like have a a, a, a virtual avatar without trousers, and everybody's fine with it. So that should be fine. But in a public one, not so. And here on, the, on this meme, basically, we say um, that. Yeah, just kick the person when he's behaving bad. Yeah, but if you don't have like the central authority on a on a server to do that, what are your thoughts about that? Like, would the, like a more decentralized metaverse or like a metaverse on the uh, with the principle of subsidiarity that like there is always like one host that can control a number of people and like kick them out if they're doing a crime or something that would be a crime. So like. How, how you think here, like in terms of like centralized and decentralized? Do centralized metaverses have like a bigger problem with this than decentralized ones? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder whether, you know, coming uh, coming from the community perspective, mm -hmm. I wonder whether something like a centralized global um, metaverse linked with a centralized global enforcement would be in line with that community spirit. I think it goes against the whole yeah. starting point and beginning of, uh, of, uh, of uh, blockchain, right? As a decentralized uh, uh, reality. So uh, there, is, there, is yeah, already, uh, there, is all, there is already a community a perspective to it which questions the centralized thing. Yeah, it, that's that's actually a, a, a quite interesting link between like because you mentioned uh, like uh, uh, now blockchain and so on. So like 
that that's a clash that happened actually in metaverse communities in the last half year because um digital ownership and so on like for the for the for the core community i would say like of the metaverses of for those who like really see like a, a, a place of expressing arts and feelings and uh uh and 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 spending time with each other and 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 working on like the extension of i mean i say it very uh, uh poetic now but working on the extension of like uh humanity with digitalism like they usually are not really like those capitalists who are like investing in crypto and we have seen like a big massive clash in the communities now when finally the the, the viewpoint from the from 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 the metaverse community is this that the crypto people finally found out for what they can use their crypto tokens for <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's the one point of view yeah and so um there are clashing a, a, a lot of like ideologies in the moment on each other and um when it comes to the centralized one yes you're right i mean like i don't think that um, most people who are like working with it and building on it envision like a centrally uh, owned metaverse where there's like one big uh, uh, Darth Vader type of entity who says like you are legal, you are not legal. These are the rules, and they are all and forever. The thing is, for the mass market, it develops in that direction because to develop a mass market, it needs somehow like this uh, bigger world where random people can 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 meet each other and watch movies with each other and so on. Because that's what's the attractiveness for the mass market. So. It's a pretty much a niche versus mass market. And I think that the mass market yeah. has all these legal problems because they are people who think that they are anonymous clash on each other, but it's very fast. Like in a consistent uh, virtual world, um, the behavior of people is much better than in like social media or in like some uh, 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 Discord or, or Facebook conversations because you have an identity and you face the social consequences. If I'm in a smaller group and i go in a world and i behave like uh, uh, a bad person people will let me feel that i they, i'm a bad person and they kick me from their world so it's all a matter of like where you put this level of authority it's like what should there be one policeman for everybody or should there be like everybody his own policeman in his own world which is for me ideal i i can maybe briefly comment on uh... Uh, not too long because I see uh, that Arthur has joined us as well. But maybe I can briefly comment from the classic, classic world. You know how, what the questions would be of who is to enforce now, who is to, uh, who is to prosecute uh, such an offense. So one question would be: Okay, should it be the prosecutors um, that have some link to the place where the avatar was created? So that will probably refer to some servers somewhere in this world. Um, or should it be those authorities that have a terrestrial link to where the person is sitting, physically sitting behind the avatar, um, or yet another place? And I can predict that different national criminal legal orders might have overlapping jurisdiction, actually, so that several jurisdictions might find themselves uh, competent uh, to act on such a on such a matter what i can say from say swiss criminal law typically you would look at where the physical person is actually sitting where that person has been in the moment of the offense uh, taking place but then again in the virtual world and transnational online world it's not that clear it may uh, also be an additional jurisdiction that may assume actually competence to prosecute this. So already from classic classic perspectives of criminal law, it may not be that clear who is to prosecute that. And so, if, if I can jump in here, apologies for my late entrance in this. Um, actually, I have prepared a really nice uh, PowerPoint and I really wanted to show it to you. Uh, but I, as you see, I'm connected with my mobile phone uh, somewhere. Uh, my devices are not made for the for the future. Seems like <laughs> not even for the metaverse. <laughs> um, so I would like to jump in here and uh, also into this discussion. Um, you talked about criminal law um, and um, uh, well, getting back to the 
to the statements. What I wanted to bring, uh, or a really core statement, is I'm a very liberal person, libertarian person, and I, I'm I'm a fan of uh, less is more. Yeah, we I think we don't even need more laws, more regulation, and more uh, provisions. Um, I think we have what we have right now in the legal world and in several <clears throat> jurisdictions let's take europe we have very um we have many 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 uh points and many uh provisions how to deal with the metaverse um i think i don't need to describe or define what we're speaking about metaverse or nfts um because you're already into this discussion um so Anyway, I mean, you mentioned beforehand uh, Facebook and other digital platforms. I think from my perspective, we have many rules, many provisions, many in several jurisdictions, and especially in the EU, we have um, a, um, the Digital Services Act and the Digital uh, Markets Act who are going to um, be enforced very soon. And there we see many uh, regulations and many uh, provisions which can be applied to such um, uh, to, to to the virtual world as well so what what we see is we have a special digital platform we have uh, to be honest we have uh, a new world which is opening up for us well, you, uh, what I heard is you mentioned islands to be sold uh, in the metaverse uh, the museums, digital marketplaces. Uh, but then coming back to the legal questions, I think we have sufficient rules how to deal with uh, things in the digital world. Um, and here, I think from our e-commerce experience, uh, our experience with Facebook and other big platforms, um, there are many rules which can be applied. Um, and I uh, think uh, right now, even if they're happening crimes, even if there's a, um, I, I've seen just a bit of the video, even if there's something happening or an island to be sold, I think we have sufficient rules in the legal world to deal with it. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, but uh, like, 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 for example, um, there are some things a bit different than like from, from, from like social network because sure. like this groping problem or like in the hardcore version from before, it's like that's something where the content of proof and I think that here is a big danger if like this is played over much and maybe this is even played a bit overboard in order to get these control mechanisms because like, for example, um, Facebook on, on, or Meta on their on, on their metaverse, like they like say that they record everything that happens in their world like for 20 minutes and then delete it. Like if something happened that you can complain and so on. And so it's like, how you see like this, this with um, this conflict between like, okay, having the ability to record crimes and then to like have uh, evidence on the crimes because technically everything that happens here in the metaverse like we could technically record and then replay after yeah it's like yeah, um is it is it should big corporations doing uh, uh like going into the metaverse space put these tools or do you see the the the, the, the privacy as a bigger good um that i can have a private conversation in the metaverse without a big entity like recording everything of my world so like here i think that this is the classic question of like do you want to fight like crime or use do you use fighting crime as an excuse to record everything <laughs> or it's like where do you would where would you draw the line here um in in the sense of surveillance and having proof for crimes i'm happy to comment on that briefly uh and I'll just uh, uh, briefly comment on what Arthur said about uh, we, we have the laws and this should be sufficient. Uh, I would not be surprised, by contrast, if many authorities, however, felt uh, fairly uncomfortable about how to apply the laws. I would also not be surprised if quite a lot of our colleagues felt uncomfortable of how to 
apply the, the applicable correct laws actually, right? So I think what I mainly intended to do here is, is to raise questions. And uh, I concur that we are not in the need of a fully fledged uh, legal endeavor of passing uh, all kind of new laws. But what I'm pretty confident about is that many lawyers would feel uncomfortable about how to actually apply it. Now, coming back to the point that uh, Conrad just made, uh, yes, indeed, you have to, two large interests, right? On the one hand, you have privacy, uh, which is a very, very high good, uh, all the more from a libertarian point of view, as Arthur mentioned. And uh, on the other hand, you have uh, the interest of actually being able to prosecute uh, offenses. So for instance, this person in the video clip uh, whose avatar got uh, gang raped, she has a legitimate interest as well that this is uh, prosecuted. Now, what makes it easier to prosecute and what makes it harder? Um, when you have a company running metaverse, let's say centralized from California, then it may be fairly difficult from, for say a European prosecutor uh, to go after such an offense because he has no direct uh, contact, there's no direct uh, powers over that company that is in a very different country and that company may not even bother uh, responding. So this is an example that illustrates how it can become difficult if by contrast that company has in a decentralized way in each country an establishment, possibly even some servers, uh, actual physical offices, then it becomes easier for a prosecutor to go after that entity. <clears throat> yeah, I'm happy to reply on this. Uh, <clears throat> Simon, thank you for, uh, for this comment. I mean, I, I can imagine that uh, judges and colleagues of ours uh, feel uncomfortable if there is something happening in the metaverse to apply these rules. Um, but I just think back, uh, let's turn back 10 years, 15 years and or a bit more and uh, colleagues and judges were even uncomfortable to apply rules uh, given what's, what was happening on Facebook. Yeah, so I, I don't see that dramatic that uh, these uh, new events happening are, are, are turning around the legal questions uh, a lot. Uh, it, it might be it might be some factual news, some okay shaping the world a bit uh, with metaverse, uh, but I think we have really sufficient sufficient rules to deal with, um, and uh, I, I would not uh, like to look so much at at crimes in happening in the metaverse. Worse, but um, but what's happening? I mean, our title is uh, the ownership, um, the digital goods. Uh, let's take uh, NFTs, uh, cryptocurrencies, wallets. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, and this is something what's also new, and that's not even also here. We don't even need new rules. We have many rules of digital ownership. Uh, digital yeah. identities uh, um, and especially on cop uh, copyright uh, measures and rules, we see that, uh, yeah, and board apes is a good example, which we've just seen. And we see that the copyright questions can can be applied or copyright rules can be applied for the metaverse and for NFT questions. Yeah, here, here is like basically one of my main questions and one, one big question is like from the VR community about like this NFT mm -hmm. craze because during this NFT craze and there was like a lot of things happened like for example my first question is is this illegal that I made a screenshot and brought that into my metaverse office I don't make it like permanent so I don't say that it's my piece of art it is basically the first Google screenshot that I found brought it in here temporary for the conference and deleted now so that I don't do any offense um, because like about when you were listening to the, like the NFT profits and NFT, uh, uh, things like this was, or is the solution to all, uh, digital ownership problems, uh, in the world. Like, at least that's 
what we get when we are listening in that, to that as a non-experts. And then also like um, something that we go better are the real museums um, selling real pictures or parts of real pictures as NFTs. It's like, what do I own when I own an NFT? And why I can still hang this monkey in my office and most probably will not get prosecuted. I hope, or how much does it cost Gross. if not somebody now prosecutes <laughs> me and you help me <laughs> because yeah, I brought yeah, it up yeah. here. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good question. Uh, uh, let's don't use the term prosecution because that's something of criminal world. Uh, when, okay. when we talk about ownership and here, special copyrights, uh, we are in a very civil uh, relationship. Yeah? We have the artists, we have the founder, we have well, let's take the artist of, of, of this picture. Um, uh, this artist has an inherent right. Uh, uh, he made this uh, painting or uh, digital picture. Yeah, that's the artist right. Yeah, that's his copyright. And there are many other cop in English. Well, in, in, in German languages, there there's there are different terms. What's the uh, original copyright on the secondary copyright. So there are uh, derived rights from the original copyright. For example, as you mentioned, uh, taking this picture and hang it to uh, for in a museum. Yeah. So this um, to, to show it in public, um, to, to show it on your device. Uh, and to your question, which rights do you have? Um, I have to say that with each and any copyright and with each and any NFT, with each and any picture, it's different because we don't know who is the artist. We don't know uh, who primary and secondary uh, copyrights there are. And we have to have a look into the specific case and then uh, um, finally decide. But to your First conclusion, I would say no, that's not, an NFT is not the solution for ownership. It's not the solution for copyright because there, if you use NFT, then you have to look really into the little details of the terms and conditions of the provisions, what's, what you actually buy with this product. And then you see if you have the right to show it in public or not. And even the right to show it in public can be limited, timely, geographically, uh, physically, or is it just a physical world? Is it just a museum? Or is it the digital world or just for a time, time slot? So that can all be, it's a nice thing. In a way, it's a very liberal world again, where you can fix your own rights, describe it. If you sell a picture, if you sell, if you have special rights, then you describe it in your own terms and conditions, and the buyer needs to know that what he's actually buying, full transparency on all the terms, um, and then it should be clear what he she can do with this picture. So basically, um, now like a, a naive response. Yeah? <laughs> so basically the whole like invention and boom of NFTs actually in the end of the day did change nothing on the ownership rights or on, on the complicated matter of uh, intellectual property, especially when it comes to arts. So that was basically, this, this is the solution to everything is basically a marketing gag of NFT sellers. Or yes is and no. that too actually, simple? The big solution is not. The, the, the new thing is that with NFT and using a certain blockchain, um, you have a publication event. Yeah, um, you trust uh, for. So wait, I'm very nervous when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> my connection. Um, you trust. You you put your full trust into the the blockchain, and that's the different thing. Yeah. When selling a picture or selling a, a lot uh, or in a house in the real world, you have actually a register where you can look into. Grundbuch uh, in German, yeah? Mm -hmm. is a register where all the transactions are saved, uh, written down and are public. So that has a publication event and you trust, you give your full trust into this register. Here in the digital world, that's a new thing. 
uh, we trust uh, what's happening in the blockchain. So actually that's the new thing and that's ha very helpful. We don't need an intermediary. We don't need a public institution uh, or a selling house or uh, whoever. If you put your trust into the blockchain, if you believe that the blockchain saves all your transactions, is a full historical register, what has happened. So then that can be a, um, yeah, the, 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 the point, the crucial point for your trust. But like the legal way, um, for example, if somebody like if I buy now or, or if somebody buys now uh, uh, a board ape NFT picture, for example, but and I use it commercially, print it on a T-shirt or print it on virtual T-shirts and sell them in in in, in the virtual world. Uh, the legal procedure that that person owning that would not be much different than from when somebody is just stealing random art, if there is an Absolutely. NFT or not. That's correct. So it doesn't save anything in 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 like uh, uh, legal <laughs> problems or costs. Apart from that, you have like one more additional proof that actually yes, I own that. Yeah, maybe more well, legal problems. <laughs> I think I honestly maybe don't see a common difference common. between what you what you said with uh, printing an NFT on a T-shirt compared to a T-shirt with uh, Mona Lisa, for example. I mean, it it's the same thing in, in my point of view i mean there is the piece of art the original piece of art with its rightful owner and uh, and all the copyright claim on, on that but everyone can wear a t-shirt with mona lisa so how, how is this different or is uh, well, sir, wait a second i just give here some clarification I, I think mona lisa is not a good example we have a in whole europe we have co copyright um well, let's say a legislation that if the artist is more than uh, 70 years dead, then the picture is um, in Germany, we call it gemeinfrei. So ready to be used by everybody. Free for so use, yeah. Free okay, for then, use. Then, not so Mona then Lisa. you can no, use the Mona Lisa. Zero, <laughs> and uh, actually in Austria, there was a nice and funny case of, um, um, of Klimt. And as you know, uh, well, Klimt made this uh, very famous picture, uh, The Kiss. Yeah. Thank you for showing it, Conrad. And um, same here. It's free to use. So somebody who is buying a Klimt picture um, needs to know that he could download it. He can take it from anywhere um, because it's free to use. Uh, there is no copyright anymore connected. Maybe yeah. two points on that, um, where we of course see differences. So if you take a, a piece of art that is not uh, more than 70 years old, as you just referred to, but a younger one and compare it to the NFT situation, we certainly have two practical differences, right? One is um, the identity of the person committing the offense, so to say. Uh, you also mentioned the public registry for real estate. Um, when you go to public registry to register an actual uh, piece of land, then of course, one of the key things you're required to show is uh, official ID, right? Passport or identity card and to sign so that there is an actual Proof, and there is more demands than this, of course, that there is an actual proof that this is you signing now in relation to that piece of land. Um, somehow different in the metaverse, of course, and NFTs. The second point I want to point out to is, uh, you know, what I compare as law, law in the books and law in action. I mean, the law in the books, of course, is what you read and what you have in principle. But law in action depends on enforcement and the possibilities of enforcement. And uh, if you don't have the identity uh, of the user behind the avatar, then uh, all the beautiful paragraphs in the, in the codes are usually not much uh, of help. And like, because this, this with digital ownership 
in general, like ownership in general in the metaverse. I mean, like, I don't want to sound like the communist here, <laughs> but a lot of people like from within the metaverse uh, uh, scene or community, I would say, um, is of the opinion that actually we don't need scarcity in the metaverse because if there is now one kind of a specific item or tool or or or, or even piece of art, it's like the replication of it doesn't cost anything. And so there is like this conflict between like the 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 the, the NFT people, I would say now, like coming from the crypto like where we say like every single item in the metaverse, like including this table, including uh, uh, the video player over there, including like every single piece of art that's hanging on the wall should have an owner. Um, what's your personal stance on like, is it really necessary to like regulate all ownership in the digital realm? Because it's numbers. They can be yeah, but, copied. <laughs> yeah, but for, uh, I mean, how I see things uh, differently from, from the real world. Uh, for example, you turn the camera and show me that table. Okay, now we're talking digital. I can print screen or I can take the recording afterwards and I can, I can recreate it. Yeah. Okay, so who's the owner of that table? Because in, 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 digital, in the digital world, you can create uh, exact copies of that. Yeah. Pixel um, by pixel, uh, space by space. And uh, okay, so that table has an owner in, you, in your uh, room right now. But if I recreate it, I can sell it again because I, I, can, I can make proof that I had created the table. <laughs> do you see my my, yeah, my I mean, like, crazy thing it's it, it's a bit like let me let me bring in something um it's a bit like this yeah so here for example i bring in a, a base this takes some time because it's rather big um opera and it's yes it's very big <laughs> <laughs> so i for example have here a replica of a statue yeah, yeah. this is like a real statue standing in vienna and mm -hmm. it's a photogrammetry. So technically, the owner, the, the ownership right for this, who like okay, the statue is yeah, it's common good, but basically the ownership are with the photographer, or not. But so if the photographer now says that this uh, 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 monument can only exist one time, we put an NFT and then sue everybody who like puts that in his virtual world. Is that then one way? Because like. The uh, technical uh, creation was done by the photographer. The yeah. statue was done by somebody 150 years ago. Okay, so it's out, so it's already a common common good. But if there is a newer art, like a statue of like a newer artist, and somebody makes just a bunch of pictures, puts them digitally together, who owns it? Well, this uh, your example reminds me of the famous uh, depiction. So see a bone peep. This is this is not a pipe. You know the picture, right? You see a picture of a pipe and the phrase goes, this is not a pipe because it is not a pipe. It is a picture of a pipe. And to yeah. transfer this to your example, we have the statute on the one hand, which is publicly owned, arguably, right? And then you have a picture of a statute that's something else. So the and then you have the third the, level, the three yeah. D rendering of those pictures of the statue. <laughs> correct, correct. Yeah, you have three levels. So the photographer may have certain rights on the picture, and, and then the third level, as you just mentioned, it uh, Alex as well. Indeed, and we have to be very precise always in law. What are we referring to? Which level are we now talking about? Yeah, yeah it's correct. Yeah, we in this in this case. We have the artist who is long dead. Yeah. Then we have the owner of the original uh, statute, which is probably the city of Vienna. And then we got the photographer who takes it from the right angle, and that's his art to take a picture. And that's the copyright of the original uh, <laughs> artist work of the uh, art. The artist, the photographer, who takes the picture, and the, the photographer has his own copyright uh, 
to belonging to him uh, for this picture. That's true. And just if to come back the, to the third the 2D so. picture, that's a photographer. If you do the 3D picture, it's the same here. Again, yeah. we have the artist has the copyright on this picture of the set. Yeah, sorry for interrupting, Arthur. I come back to the question that Alex actually <clears throat> kind of precisely lined out. How about if I imitate this, this table, you know, can I mm. have uh, intellectual property on it? Then again, we have different uh, different ways of protecting intellectual property. Mm -hmm. One is uh, one is patent law, right? So, Alex, in your mm -hmm. example, in, in patent law, you would typically ask, you know, is this something really of novelty? You know, does it does it add something? Uh, simply put, to what has already been here. So, a, a table that appears to be rather standard. Uh, even in the metaverse world, rather standard, would typically not be a subject or would not be a, would be not be suitable to be protected by patent law. I I see, but the uh, the question I it it was more directed to to things that are sold as NFTs. For example, the 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 picture of the board monkey. If I start recreating it digitally, um, it would have uh, been virtually an exact copy with no, uh, let's say, no quality differences, no uh, no differences at, at all. Because if you take a photo of a, of a real item, then there's a difference. If you uh, if you paint after a photograph there's a difference if you recreate a physical object there could be differences but in the digital world you can technically create a 100 percent exact copy of that object without any loss in quality and anything and basically you would have the same object but it's not the same object <laughs> So Arthur, the, Arthur, I didn't want to steal your time any further. That's why I'm staying mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. No, I, I, it's a pity that uh, I, I had lots of pictures in my presentation. Uh, in any case, what we see here, what we also see in the, for, I mean, I, I, I heard a bit what, what you, Simon, uh, um, presented beforehand. And uh, especially what you spoke about the islands and what the huge investments in the metaverse are, are currently. Um, and what we see is, 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 is very funny. I mean, uh, you, Simon, and myself, we, we have seen uh, the gaming world and the gambling world, let's say, let's turn 20 years back. Then about eight, six years back, there was a new world coming up with the cryptocurrencies and blockchain uh, things. And it reminds me just what, what we have seen in the past. Uh, we, we see in the digital world a combination. First of all, something what we, we think that it's just existing in a digital world. But then in a way, it's combining uh, later on real world and, and digital world things. For example, take 20 years back, 10 years back, the online casino things. Yeah, uh, There are actually right now online casino offerings, core digital offerings. Uh, but what we also see is that uh, companies who are investing in it are very much in also into land-based uh, offerings. Same now with uh, cryptocurrencies. We first thought there are two worlds, two existing projects. It's yeah. the banking, uh, the national banking system, and the cryptocurrency system. A uh, very centralized system versus a decentralized system. But uh, in a way, both need each other, which is funny. Yeah. Uh, you still need a bank account in a way, yeah. Or if there's in one day is a CBDC, a, a central bank digital currency, you still need a bank account of the let's say central bank. And the other, let's say, uh, Lebensconcept, yeah, uh, life concept, 
uh, is uh, in a decentralized world, uh, cryptocurrencies, it does not exist on its own. I'm, I'm very much a fan of it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm promoting it. The whole law firm I'm running is, uh, let's say, 100% uh, believing in this. Uh, but still, I think there is a development combining these, thing, these things. Mm -hmm. And coming back to the metaverse, uh, it's funny to see the board ape uh, pictures, uh, but I just recently saw some news that there is a, a restaurant plan, the board ape yacht club uh, restaurant. I don't know if you heard of it. And the things, I, from my perspective, do not exist only digitally. Yeah, you yep. still want your real life. You might show off in the metaverse, have built your own second life there, uh, but still it's depicting your real world life or the other way around, you show off with your uh, digital world and your life, your second life there in the real world. So it's always has a connection to the real world and to physical things. And that might also be a solution uh, for, for legally speaking, uh, in the international, for the rules of international law, you always need a triggering point. You always need a special physical connection to it to apply rules. Yeah? Is it Austrian law? Is it European law? Uh, is it criminal law? Who did it? And in the end, it's again, physically the, the closest connection where was where happened something yeah mm -hmm. and still i think that's my plaidoyer and that's my message uh still yeah. the real world issue still matter <laughs> well if i may just briefly uh, because i'm aware in the interest of time that we are probably wrapping up soon uh it's true i concur with arthur that the so-called principle of territoriality uh, is dominant in the way we conceptualize the, the legal world internationally. Uh, yet, uh, it's not absolute. There are uh, some exceptions and there are also differences from country to country. So for instance, I think it's an open secret that the, the United States understand their scope of jurisdiction uh, significantly broader than <laughs> other, other countries do. You know, it may take uh, a little fly uh, of a link to the U.S. and the U.S. law is applicable and courts will find themselves uh, competent. Another example uh, in transnational situations, uh, online situations, uh, some courts may assume jurisdiction very easily and say, well, just because the user is sitting on his uh, laptop on the one end, uh, that's enough. That's enough. Even if the servers and everything else is happening uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. and, and just a third example in competition law, uh, we have the effects doctrine. We look at where does an effect take, uh, take place of a merger. Uh, so even if the, the companies are not in, say, Europe or in, in Austria, uh, it may still be prohibiting uh, the, the merger. So I'm just saying this uh, to illustrate how the metaverse might also be uh, seen by some legal scholars uh, as not necessarily linking uh, in all situations to territoriality. Mm -hmm. So it means potentially the metaverse has uh, worldwide effects, no? If everybody can receive uh, publications, messages from the metaverse worldwide, so your play year of the effects doctrine is that potentially it could be the, legis the, the applicable legislation of each and any country. Yes, what I want to kind of sens sensitive uh, ourselves to is the constellation where several jurisdictions consider mm. themselves uh, competent at the same time. Mm. This is mm. where it gets uh, tricky, tricky and messy, right? Mm. right. Like. I mean, what's happening in the end of the day, in the end of the day, like the metaverse um, is sort of like the final medium, like every communication, every former uh, 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 way of communication, picture from, 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 from letters to pictures. So like we can all put it in one world, like spend time with each other. And it does absolutely not matter in the metaverse from which legal jurisdiction somebody comes from, because like 
um, a Russian person can come in here and we can build something, even though we are under sanctions, for example. Um, or uh, uh, like people from all over the world like share a space. So like, I mean, logically for me would be that the, 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 the metaverse itself makes its regulations because like that's where it affects everybody at the same time and not like in which country I'm sitting currently or what's my IP address. So oh. in the end of the day, in the ideal world, like there are multiple metaverses and everyone with its own jurisdictions and like rules. And you, you join the one where you feel comfortable and you visit the other one for a holiday where you feel comfortable for a holiday, a mental holiday. <laughs> that, but yeah, the with like multiple is... already existing legislation saying that they are responsible. Um, yeah, that might be complicated in the future, I assume. <laughs> I, I see this is a really tricky situation that uh, jurisdictions uh, are overlapping and uh, everyone can be liable in the same time and no one can be liable in the same time. So <laughs> I think uh, I think this uh, all these legal talk on the on the metaverse could consist of a, of a whole conference subject. <laughs> there's so much to talk about and so much to cover uh thank you everyone uh we ran out of time like five minutes ago but uh as usual good panels require require more uh, more time uh thank you everyone conrad simon arthur thank you for your for your input and a really nice talk mm -hmm. uh, and we're really looking forward to to see you in uh, in our next editions